You know, in 2011, relations between China and the United States are rel in relatively good shape. But there is a wide array of difficulties that bedevil the bilateral relationship. Most of these are not really new. They've been with us for many years now. Trade disputes, human rights, Taiwan, to name some of the uh, most enduring issues. Each of these is important in its own right and individually challenging. But the combination of all these is daunting. Indeed, perhaps almost overwhelming. My talk this afternoon looks at the ongoing security tensions in U.S.-China relations, specifically the periodic harsh verbal salvos and provocative actions launched by China's military. China certainly appears intent on becoming a responsible great power. Beijing continues to insist, as it has for many decades, that peace and development are the key trends of the times. And in the defense white paper, the latest defense white paper that was issued uh, in March, uh, that statement is, uh, is reiterated. Beijing takes great pains to stress that its growing power does not threaten any nation. And the world is witnessing China's peaceful rise or peaceful development. China is increasingly integrated in the global economy and embraces cooperation and multilateralism in unprecedented ways. Yet, at the same time, observers are ultimately alarmed and perplexed by the recurring harsh rhetoric of China's senior military leaders and intermittent but provocative acts by China's People's Liberation Army, or PLA. And PLA, of course, refers to all branches of China's military, not just the, the ground forces. It's a problem with the translation, not, not, not with, uh, uh, with the, the uh, Chinese uh, terms. So what explains the outspokenness of Chinese officers and the audacious actions of China's military? Why does the PLA appear so belligerent? Many uh, Chinese analysts assume that Chinese commanders are more hardline, but not necessarily more bellicose towards the United States than their civilian leaders, and that the PLA is tightly controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Outspoken officers and provocative episodes, however, raise questions about these assumptions. Is there a significant chasm between the thinking of China's civilian leaders and its military leaders? Is there a worrisome laxity in, China's, in civilian control of China's military? In other words, are there serious gaps in China's civil military relations? Now let me explain. I use the term gap in two ways. First, to refer to a possible difference or disconnect between the attitudes and perspectives of civilian military elites based upon different career paths life experiences and bureaucratic interests. Secondly, I use the term gap to refer to possible loose civilian control of the military. I borrow this term gap from Peter Fever and Richard Kahn who use it to analyze the pattern of their findings in U.S. civil military relations at the turn of the century. This is what I like to call the so what question. Even if gaps exist between soldiers and civilians in China, does it matter? Well, I tend to think it does. Let me explain. The PLA is considered a key bureaucratic and institutional actor in China, in domestic politics and in foreign policy. In times of crisis or war, soldiers suddenly become even more important. If there are gaps in terms of perspectives and control, this could be really critical. Even if these gaps simply translate into lack of coordination or clumsiness in a crisis, this could hinder resolution or even contribute to escalation. Let me outline my talk. First, I'm going to refresh, refresh memories in the room by briefly summarizing some of the most memorable rhetorical flourishes by Chinese soldiers and the most dramatic incidents involving China's military during the past 15 odd years. Second, I'll ID some of the main characteristics of China's civil military relations. Third, I'll sketch out four possible explanations for these episodes I mentioned and suggest which I think are more plausible. Then I will provide evidence and context from each episode to support my interpretations. 
and then finally I'll make some concluding observations. So first of all, some, some evidence. Three episodes of, of rhetoric and three episodes of actions. The first uh, rhetorical episode, in October 1995, an unnamed Chinese general allegedly makes not so veiled nuclear threats to a retired U.S. ambassador. Quote, the United States cares more about Los Angeles than it does about Taipei. Now here at USC, you assume that to be the case. <laughs> Washington does care about you. You can feel the love sometimes. Um, but seriously, but when a PLA officer says that, it's a little disconcerting. The report appeared in a, a New York Times article in January of uh, 1996. And since then, that quote has taken on a life of its own. I just saw it quoted the other day in a, in a uh, Washington-based uh, publication. Fast forward 10 years uh, to uh, July of 2005. Uh, PLA General Zhu Chenghu speaking in near-perfect English in front of assembled foreign journalists warns that in a nuclear exchange with China, quote, hundreds of U.S. cities would be destroyed. Is L.A. in there? I don't know. I don't know. But, but seriously, this, this, he said this and, uh, you know, it got people's attention, not surprisingly. Uh, the third uh, rhetorical flourish uh, most recent one I want to uh, draw your attention to was in August of uh, last year. Chinese officials and, and, uh, and talking heads were making multiple warnings to the United States not to send the aircraft carrier, the USS George Washington, into the Yellow Sea on exercises. Someone identified as a PLA general voices concerns in a signed editorial in the Liberation Army Daily, the Jiafang Jinbao, that exercises close to the coast threaten China's security interests. Moreover, in what could be interpreted as a thinly veiled threat directed towards the United States, the writer warns, quote, if a person doesn't attack me, I won't attack them. But if a person attacks me, I will definitely counterattack. Further, the writer warns, he's not joking. Now to the actions. You're getting really quiet in here. <laughs> Maybe you're getting a little concerned. There's, there's a little bit of good news in this, a little bit of silver lining, I promise you. To talk about some, some actions, three actions. The most famous of this occurred, famous of these actions occurred in April of 2001, and that's exactly 10 years ago. In, uh, on April, it was no April Fool, let me tell you, uh, when a uh, Chinese uh, J-8 fighter collided with a U.S. Navy EP-3 surveillance aircraft in international airspace about 70 miles southeast of Hainan Island. Initially, China didn't respond when contacted by Washington or the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. The plane makes an emergency landing in Hainan on a, at a, a Chinese naval base. The crew of 24 was held for 11 days. The episode in Washington raises the specter of an Iranian-style hostage crisis. Fortunately, it, didn't, it had a happier ending. In 2007, in January, another episode, China conducts an anti-satellite test, unannounced. It's the greatest single man-made producer of space debris in history. I was just talking to one of my RAND colleagues the other day, and he said, it probably constitutes about 10% of all space debris floating out there. And eventually, it's going to drop down on Earth somewhere. So, of course, there's plenty of other space debris out there, too, contributed by other countries. But this uh, particular anti-satellite test, there was basically radio silence. No official comment was made about the test for two weeks. Speaking 10 days after the test, Chinese Foreign Minister Li Jiaoxing claimed to have, quote, not received any confirmed information about the event, unquote. Moving to January of this year, a PLA Air Force J-20 stealth fighter aircraft makes its first public test flight during the visit to China of U.S. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates. When Gates asked President Hu Jintao about the test, 
um, the Chinese leader reportedly appeared surprised. So what are we supposed to make of all this? Well, hopefully I'll clarify the situation. What's going on? Could there be civil military gaps? Well, what are the possible explanations? Assuming that we don't uh, conclude that Chinese soldiers are Dr. Strangelove caricatures, bloodthirsty warmongers foaming at the mouth ready to fight the United States, then I suggest there may be four, at least four possibilities. One, we are witnessing a carefully scripted and well-acted drama. Two, the differences between soldiers and civilians are real and unscripted. Three, the Chinese soldiers might be rogue warriors. Fourth, Chinese soldiers may be saboteurs trying to undermine U.S.-China relations. None of these possible explanations is reassuring. Only the first possibility assumes the absence of any gaps in China's civil military relations. The other three suggest the existence of serious gaps be between China's military and civilian leaders. The first explanation, carefully, careful scripting and well-rehearsed dramatic uh, production, would indicate a high level of close coordination, which would do Hollywood proud. I had to put that in because I'm, well, not in Hollywood. I, I recognize you're in reality, not Hollywood, but it's just down the road. The second explanation, real and unscripted differences, would indicate a serious gap in the attitudes along civil military lines. The third explanation, a rogue Chinese military, would mean a military, the uniform, the, would mean a PLA, the uniform members of which are essentially free agents, uncoordinated and largely out of civilian control. The fourth explanation, a relatively autonomous and cohesive PLA, a corporate military actively looking out for its own bureaucratic interests. Of course, these poss possibilities are more ideal types and may not precisely reflect reality. Indeed, these possibilities are not necessarily mutually exclusive. In fact, the truth, I think, appears to be lies somewhere in between these explanations. Specifically, the verbiage is scripted but sincere, somewhere between possibilities one and two. And the provocative acts are calculated and meant to signal deterrence, but largely uncoordinated and independent of civilian entities, somewhere between possibilities three and four. Before going on to examine more carefully these episodes, let's consider some of the uh, key features of China's civil military relations, specifically what kind of gaps may or may not exist. What about a gap in attitudes and perspectives? Well, members of a nation's armed forces are part of a larger society and hence share key aspects of its culture and values. This much was, has been noted by uh, military sociologist uh, Morris Janowitz. Nevertheless, due to soldiers' professions, uh, the profession of arms, soldiers possess uh, their own distinctive culture or subculture, depending on how you want to uh, define it, with a set of core values and attitudes that are have some significant differences with those of the civilian world. Sam Huntington's depiction of a conservative, pessimistic, and realistic, or realist, excuse me, military mind, tends to be borne out in empirical tests. Military personnel do hold different perspectives and mindsets than civilian elites, especially political leaders who have never served in the armed forces. For example, the work of Richard Betts on U.S. elites reveals that more often than not, senior uniformed leaders are significantly more reluctant than their civilian counterparts to advocate the use of force. My own work on, U uh, on Chinese elites finds a similar pattern. A gap seems to manifest itself in policy orientations of, 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 uh, excuse me, of Chinese elites in uniform and those in mufti. Chinese soldiers also tend to be more nationalistic as well as more hardline towards the United States and for that matter Taiwan than their uh, civilian counterparts. But hold on, you say. 
those uh, PLA leaders you quoted a few minutes ago, they don't sound too conservative, pessimistic, realist, or even mild-mannered to me. Well, especially when you compare it to China's civilian leaders. Now, I haven't quoted China's civilian leaders, but they can be bombastic too, but by and large, they're pretty mild-mannered uh, and avoid, uh, tend to avoid the, the more confrontational uh, uh, incendiary remarks I just mentioned. So if this, is, if this is so, then why do Chinese soldiers sound so hawkish, like fire-breathing dragons? Well, it's a good point, and I'd like to try and explain. Chinese soldiers are used to confronting an asymmetry of military power when the PLA faces adversaries. You know, China has, China's military has historically been, tended to be weaker than its adversaries. So uh, this can be extremely daunting, especially when facing the best equipped, best trained, and most technologically sophisticated armed force in the United States. I'm a little biased. I work for the military, but I think it's basically true. We're not that as good as we should be at, at fighting uh, irregular warfare, if you like, uh, and uh, counterinsurgencies. But nevertheless, we do have the best, best equipped, best trained, mili battle-tested military in the world. And the Chinese know that. They watch very carefully uh, our uh, performance in Iraq and Afghanistan and uh, ongoing efforts in other places like, uh, like Libya. However, the PLA also has a level of confidence coming from a long and distinguished track record of overcoming great odds to defeat or at least hold its own against more powerful adversaries, including the United States and Korea. Because that was uh, 60 years ago last year, China intervened in Korea. And in Chinese minds, they beat the US. Now, you can quibble about that. But I like to say that the PLA in Korea fought the most powerful military in the world to a standstill. Now, you know, we can, we can debate there, was, there were limitations uh, put on both militaries by their respective political leadership. Um, but from the, from the Chinese military perspective, they acquitted themselves very well in Korea, despite uh, great adversary, I mean adversity, excuse me. Furthermore, the PLA also has confidence that when maintaining a negative, while facing a negative asymmetry of hard power, they can offset this by a more uh, positive asymmetry in China's favor when the degree of motivation or strength of national interest is concerned. Chi in other words, Chinese soldiers believe they are fighting for vital national interests and are more willing to fight and die for their cause, I'll give an example here, Taiwan, than their adversary, or potential adversary, who they uh, expect might be, uh, in a, at least definitely in a Taiwan scenario, the United States. Chinese soldiers in the modern era have a tradition of issuing stern vocal warnings to their potential adversaries, part of a distinctive Chinese calculus of deterrence, first identified by Alan Whiting decades ago. In other words, tough talking generals are seeking to shape and deter the United States. So what about this uh, a gap in, in civilian control that I raised uh, the possibility of a little while ago? Well, there may be a gap. In the US, let me, let me step back a little bit. In the US, back in the Bush administration, complaints surfaced regarding micromanagement by top civilian officials specifically, uh, notably, uh, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld, into matters such as the planning and execution of the 2003 invasion and subsequent occupation of Iraq. Just as excessive meddling by civilian leaders in the purview of the uniformed uh, military profession can be problematic, so too can extreme aloofness. In recent years, Beijing's civilian Communist Party leaders have adopted what I think is a hands-off approach in the day-to-day -day affairs of the PLA. The disposition and background of political and military leaders have altered the format of civil military relations and the structure of the mechanisms of control in China. A core distinguishing characteristic of the Long March generation was substantial overlap between political and military elites, 
former top leaders such as Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping, uh, the most prominent members of this uh, generation, participated in the legendary 1930s track that ensured the survival of the communist movement. These men were both civilian and military leaders. The divide between the two was blurred. By the 1990s, mid-1990s, the Long March generation was dying off. Oh. China's civilian civil military uh, relations had evolved. Successor generations had greater differentiation and distinction between civil and civilian and military leaders. At the highest echelons, leaders such as retired uh, top leader Jiang Zemin and current paramount leader Hu Jintao, while occupying the post of Commander-in-Chief in the PLA, in addition to their formal government and party posts, did not ex ex exert the same degree of influence in or engender the same degree of deference from China's military men. In the 21st century, China's uh, party leaders are civilian technocrats with little or no military experience or expertise. They are there are, excuse me, close and multi multiple overlapping linkages between the party and the military, if only because the fact that all senior soldiers are party members and soldiers occupy seats on the Politburo and Central Committee. Moreover, there are political commissars and party committees throughout the PLA. Nevertheless, what is widely assumed to be the key mechanism of party control or civilian control is the Central Military Commission. It is composed largely of soldiers, though. It has 12 members. Ten of them are in uniform, only two civilians. Now, the two civilians are arguably the most important individuals on that, on that uh, body, but uh, it hardly seems uh, to me to be a uh, function as a mechanism of, of civilian uh, control or, or firm civilian control. Moreover, the Minister of National Defense is always an active duty general. In short, there is, there is some question about whether civilian control of the military in China, whether there is civilian control of the military in China, and if that exists, then how does it actually function? Well, to recap, we've outlined uh, six controversial episodes. I've sketched out four possible explanations, talked a little bit about uh, Chinese civil-military relations. Now let's take a closer look at those six, uh, six episodes I mentioned. First, as far as the, re re the rhetorical uh, episodes. What about the uh, comment, the full context of the comment made by the PLA general in 1995 about LA? Remember, uh, remember that? Well, according to uh, retired U.S. Ambassador Chaz Freeman, a senior Chinese official commented to him, quote, you, the United States, do not have the strategic leverage that you had in the 1950s when you threatened nuclear strikes against us. You were able to do that because we could not hit back. And remember, at this time, China didn't have any nuclear weapons in the, in the 1950s. But if you hit us now, we can hit back. So you will not make those threats. In the end, you care more about Los Angeles than you do about Taipei. So that's the, now that you've heard that, you feel better? <laughs> Maybe. But this remark also explained a little more about the context of the remark. It was made during an October uh, 1995 private conversation between two men, the uh, former ambassador and the, the, the Chinese military figure. It was made public three months later by a journalist who had, prom had ostensibly, uh, supposedly assured the person who told him this information that he would not make it public. Does that mean you can't trust a journalist? No. I, I, trust, these, I trust journalists, mostly, mostly. Seriously, the, uh, the identity of the PLA general has never officially been released, but uh, experts assume, widely, it's widely assumed that it's General Xiong Guangkai, and at the time, General Xiong was the head of uh, Chinese military intelligence. Now, while General Xiong, or whoever that individual, uh, unnamed individual, uh, was, 
may not have anticipated that his remarks would make headlines in a major American newspapers. He would almost certainly have assumed, indeed desired, that these remarks would be relayed to U.S. officials. Freeman himself interpreted the statement, Charles Freeman interpreted the statement, not as a threat, but, it, but as a deterrent signal to the United States. A warning that for China, where Taiwan is concerned, no sacrifice is too great. And especially, as I said, that asymmetry of motivation, that's where I think this comes in. Indeed, high-level officials, uh, other high-level officials reportedly told Freeman that, quote, Beijing would sacrifice millions of men and entire cities to assure the unity of China, and opined that the United States would not make similar sacrifices. Moreover, this remark came in the midst of the 1995-96 Taiwan Strait Crisis, when China was lobbing missiles uh, at, uh, off the Taiwan coast. Um, and China was therefore, I think, engaged in coercive diplomacy against the island, and at the same trying, time trying to persuade the United States to stay out. All right, moving uh, forward 10 years uh, to the uh, 2005, the famous, infamous uh, utterance uh, that was staged in front of journalists um, by uh, Major General Zhu Chenghu of the PLA's National Defense University. He said, and I quote, if the Americans draw up their missiles and position-guided position ammunition on a target zone on Chinese territory, I think we will have to respond with nuclear weapons. Zhu continued, if the Americans are determined to interfere in a Taiwan scenario, we will be determined to respond. We Chinese will prepare ourselves for the destruction of all cities east of Xi'an. Of course, Americans will have to be prepared that hundreds of cities will be destroyed by the Chinese. Unquote. How are you feeling now? Okay. But, and remember, this was given in English. This was prepared, it was, given, it was delivered in English uh, to assembled journalists. While General, Chu, uh, General Zhu excuse me, was uh, reportedly re reprimanded for his remarks, the sanction constituted, I think, a token gesture, and it did not prevent his subsequent promotion. Zhu's premeditated statement came on the heels of the passage of China's anti-secession law. By the national, passed by the National People's Congress in March of 2005. Article 8 of that law justifies the use of, quote, non-peaceful means and other necessary measures in the event that Taiwan independent secessionist, secessionist forces act uh, to harm China's sovereignty and territorial integrity, unquote. So some, uh, some Chinese uh, uh, have told me that that's, that's a paper missile lobbed at, at, at Taiwan. It's, a, it's an effort to warn, warn Taiwan uh, not to uh, push it, go down the independence road. But here again, this is uh, uh, General Zhu's remarks were aimed at, at the United States, at seeking to deter the United States. What about the third rhetorical flourish? Uh, happened last summer vis-a-vis -vis the Yellow Sea. China at the time was very irate at what it saw as overly assertive rhetoric and meddling behavior by the Obama administration. I'll be happy to elaborate in the, in the, in the Q&A, um, but I'm just going to summarize uh, here, especially with the South China Sea. Remember uh, uh, the uh, Secretary of State uh, remarked in Hanoi at an ASEAN uh, regional forum meeting that uh, the United States had uh, national interest, a national interest in the South China Sea. And this really uh, got China upset um, because from China's perspective, the United States at the, at the, towards the end of the Bush administration had lowered its profile or level of commitment in East Asia. And so uh, from China's perspective, uh, the United States was coming back in. Uh, to, a, to an area where China had assumed they, uh, we, we were, we were uh, stepping back. 
Beijing has become increasingly assertive over claims in maritime areas in what it believes are its exclusive economic zones. And remember, your territorial waters, I believe, go out 12 miles, but uh, under the UN Conventional Law of the Sea, uh, countries can claim up to 200 miles out, uh, not as sovereign as, as their sovereign uh, maritime territories, but the right to exploit economic resources in those, in those, in that, uh, in those areas. And from the Chinese perspective, that means that other countries cannot operate military, uh, military vessels without the permission of, of the country uh, with the, uh, claiming the EEZ. So China was upset about planned U.S.-South Korean exercises uh, to take place in the Yellow Sea, which is, if you look at it, if, you, if you're thinking of a map, it's uh, off, it is indeed off the coast of off the coast of China, not that far away from China's uh, heartland, the center of uh, China's uh, political, um, uh, the, the capital of Beijing. But this exercises had been postponed in the wake of North Korea's unprovoked sinking of the, of the Republic of Korea's uh, corvette, the Chonan. So uh, this ex U.S. determination to go forward at an appropriate time with this exercise uh, was meant to send a signal more to North Korea than, than, than to China. But the combination of events uh, during the first half of 2010 heightened China's level of attention in the lead up to this exercise and to an escalation of rhetoric. Indeed, there were repeated uh, statements warning the U.S. not to go ahead with these exercises. And uh, one uh, Chinese observer claimed this was unprecedented, this level of rhetoric by the Chinese, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese government uh, spokesman. Don't do this. America. One of the most inflammatory remarks was made by someone identified as Major General Luoyan. He stated, and this was written in the uh, Liberation Army Daily, the official newspaper of the, the PLA, he said, in, you know, in Chinese, ren bu fan wo, wo bu fan ren. Ren fan wo, wo bi fan ren. Meaning, you know, you don't if you don't attack me, I won't attack you. But if you attack me, I'm definitely going to nail you. <laughs> right? I'm going to strike back. Uh, and there's two things to note about this quote. One is it has a history. It's a favorite line of Mao Zedong. It's been used on a number of occasions before China used, w essentially went to war. Um, so this, this, when somebody says this in China, when a soldier says this in China, people people who have any understanding of, of, of China's military history uh, take note. The second point to, to, to keep in mind is actually when General Law said this, he was retired. Okay, so he was, but he was widely cited as, gen, as, a, as general. You know, and when, when so this, uh, this obscured the nature of his remarks and, and uh, was, made it uh, amplified their their meaning. You know, certainly American generals are free to go around, uh, retired generals are free to state their mind, uh, but usually when they're quoted, they are explicitly identified as, as retired. What about the actions? The uh, EP3 incident, the Hainan Island incident in uh, 2001, I think this is probably the best known uh, confrontation between the militaries of the United States and China in recent years. As I said, it occurred in international airspace over the South China Sea, about 70 miles from Hainan Island. A PLA Naval Air Force uh, F-8 collided with this uh, a larger uh, US EP-3 surveillance aircraft. After the collision, the uh, Chinese fighter crashed into the sea. Its pilot ejected. Uh, but uh, was presumed dead. He was, his body was never found. And the U.S. aircraft, as I mentioned, was forced to make an emergency landing at a Chinese airbase. It took many hours for Beijing to confirm the incident had happened and that the U.S. crew had landed safely. 
Also, it took 11 days and many rounds of negotiations for the uh, American military personnel to be released, and three more months before the aircraft was returned. On July 3, 2001, four pieces, the aircraft was disassembled and loaded into a chartered Russian uh, cargo plane and flown out. U.S. Uh, diplomats uh, were eager, of course, to meet with the crew uh, that had been uh, detained on, on Hainan Island, um, and eventually, after a few days, they were allowed to fly down to Hainan Island and meet meet with the crew and, and make sure that they were uh, in, good, uh, in good health and, and, and good spirits. China's handling of this episode revealed a disturbing lack of communication and coordination between the PLA and their civilian superiors and Chinese diplomats. Washington was deeply concerned that the PLA had not provided timely and accurate information to uh, China's civilian leadership. Moreover, China refused to acknowledge that the pilot of the F-8 may have been responsible for the tragedy. In fact, the fatal accident was caused, we know, by the uh, aerial antics of Le Lieutenant Commander Wang Wei. Video footage later, later revealed, uh, released by the Pentagon shows a uh, pattern of risky activity by the same pilot on other occasions. And he would literally fly right up next to the U.S. plane and, and like wave. Um, and needless to say, that kind of activity is, 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 is very dangerous. But it's doubtful that at that time, maybe it may since have changed, but it's doubtful at that time that China's civilian leaders were aware of this, this behavior by Chinese, air, air, uh, Chinese pilots. Moving to 2007, uh, the anti-satellite test, a medium-range uh, ballistic missile was launched from Sichuan province and destroyed an aging Chinese meteorological satellite in orbit approximately 600 miles uh, above the Earth. The test was a success, and the satellite broke into thousands of fragments. According to the experts, the explosion, as I mentioned, uh, produced more space debris than anything else, any other single human event. So I guess that doesn't include, you know, accidental, you know, acts of nature where asteroids collide with, with things. This was a, a human event. There was, as I mentioned, no warning of the test and uh, no immediate confirmation uh, of the uh, test afterwards. Now we know that China is engaged in a vigorous military space program that includes a significant anti-satellite component. China's military realizes uh, that uh, satellites are very important in modern war and no more important than to the U.S. military. Um, so it makes sense that they would be thinking about how to counteract uh, this uh, technological um, dimension of, of uh, uh, American uh, modern warfare. Chinese leaders, civilian leaders, have approved and sanctioned the program. This wasn't the first anti-satellite test the PLA has conducted, but it was the first fully successful one, and it was quite, uh, quite an impressive one. While some observers suggested the test reveals a rogue military operating completely outside of the control of China's top leaders, this just doesn't seem plausible. On the other hand, evidence suggests that senior Chinese leaders did not know the test details or schedule. In any case, the event was poorly handled by Beijing. After the fact, spin control was disjointed and even contradictory. Explanations of the test appear to have made a... Uh, a farce of China's claim to oppose the militarization of space. Two months later, Pr Premier Wen Jiabao insisted to reporters that the test was, quote, an experiment, and declared China's position on the peaceful utilization of space remains unchanged. Of course, it's only logical, as I mentioned, that the PLA would pursue such options given U.S. policies on space. So I'm not suggesting what China is actually doing is bad. It's just the way they've gone about it that's worrying. It is possible that the PLA assumed that a successful anti-satellite test would not elicit much reaction. I mean, it sounds a little... We may find that hard to believe, but it certainly is possible that they uh, underestimated the impact of this, uh, this test would have. It's also possible the test was handled without fanfare because of the possibility of failure. Um, 
Remember, China's space launches until very recently were not televised live. Why? Because they're really embarrassed if something would go wrong. It would be humiliating. Now they become more confident, and so uh, these uh, space launches are televised, televised live. Even so, one would expect that when the test proved successful, Beijing would have made some kind of public announcement. Most conceivable is the test is a prime example of the PLA on a loose leash. It's also possible, of course, the test was intended as a warning to the United States, a signal that U.S. satellites are no longer beyond the reach of China. Indeed, PLA writings stress the importance of attacking satellites of advers adversaries. Some military uh, researchers in China claim that the test was an act of deterrence. But uh, I'm a little bit suspicious that this might be simply an opportunistic ex post facto rationale. But such rhetoric is consistent, actually, with recent PLA doctrinal writings that state the importance of employing deterrence in space that will create great shock and awe effects. Hmm, where have we heard that shock and awe? Anyway. So we're, we don't have a, the United States doesn't have a, a monopoly on, on shock and awe. Most recently, uh, then the third uh, episode, the uh, J-20 uh, stealth fighter test. Didn't Chinese soldiers realize the U.S. Secretary of Defense would be in Beijing? Of course they did. But this doesn't mean the PLA intentionally targeted Gates necessarily either to embarrass him and or to send a message to the Pentagon. The evidence suggests the timing of the test had less to do with the visit of Gates and more to do with the fact that the test had been scheduled for months. The Gates visits, important to remember, by contrast had been hastily arranged to occur just before President Hu Jintao's visit to the United States a week later. So this, the visit had been arranged rather hastily and the uh, test flight had been arranged, had been planned for many months. Now, another point to keep in mind is the date of this test was quite auspicious from a Chinese perspective. January the 11th of uh, the year 11, which uh, is a, can be abbreviated in Chinese to Yao Yao, Yao, Yao Yao. Okay, so. No, but it, I mean, it sounds silly, but you know, auspiciousness uh, counts. Um, and it's, it's entirely possible uh, that uh, this was an important reason uh, for choosing that particular date. And also remember, there was no effort made to hide that a test was in the works. The Chinese media was awash with reports the test flight would occur in the near future. While the PLA almost certainly considered the fact the test would be noticed by a top U.S. defense official, it likely concluded the test would not be viewed as unduly provocative. The event was more a celebration of a significant Chinese accomplishment. But the test was probably expected to signal nothing more than growing Chinese strength, certainly not considered provocative or intended to embarrass Secretary Gates. It is hard to conceive of Hu Jintao not being aware of the stealth program and the series of tests planned. However, it's entirely possible that Hu did not know the precise timing of the tests. If he had, it's likely he would have instructed the PLA Air Force to reschedule. Hu certainly would not want anything to cast a shadow on his own imminent visit to the United States. He would certainly not want to want to purposefully embarrass a senior Chinese official on the eve of his trip. Secretary Gates later told reporters, quote, I asked President Hu about the test, and he told me that it had absolutely nothing to do with my visit. It had been pre-planned. And he said, when he asked, do you believe it? Do you believe what the Chinese president told you? He said, I take President Hu at his word. So we've got these uh, six episodes, uh, three uh, rhetoric, incendiary rhetoric, and three audacious acts. As I said, there are many, many other examples I could point to, but these are some of the most, uh, uh, the most uh, 
significant or, or most uh, highly uh, publicized. And as I said, they're often, often uh, especially those quotes in 1995 and 2005, are often uh, trotted out uh, to highlight, the f uh, to, to support arguments that China is ready to take on the U.S. militarily in a fight. So, is this, uh, what, what are we to make of these, uh, these uh, episodes? Well, I think the uh, hawkish rhetoric of the uh, PLA seems to be part of a deliberate and, cal deliberate and calculated Chinese deterrent effect. It may not be the most well-coordinated deterrent effect, but I think it, it seems to be a, a fairly deliberate and calculated one. As I said, although not well coordinated with China's civilian uh, civilian leaders, and the periodic provocative acts by China's armed forces seem to reflect uh, loose and hands off civilian control. I don't think it's accurate to label the PLA as a rogue military. I've uh, identified the the inter the linkages uh, between the party and the military, so uh, I don't think that's I don't think that's accurate. The armed forces are not completely separate or in, from or independent of China's civilian leadership. In fact, as I mentioned, all military leaders are member of the, members of the Communist Party. And the PLA has significant representation on the Communist Party Politburo, Politburo and Central Committee. In fact, soldiers comprise 8% of the seats on the Politburo, 2 of a total of, of, a total of 25 and soldiers uh, account for 18 percent of the seats on the Central Committee, 65 seats out of a total of 371. I think a more appropriate term to describe the PLA is not uh, rogue, but roguish. It means yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, on a, they're on a loose leash. They, they uh, act can act fairly autonomously, but they're not completely independent or separate from, from China's, uh, China's civilian leaders or the Communist Party. So under this formulation, all major defense policies, programs, and objectives are devised, approved, and implemented with a full knowledge of China's senior civilian leaders. However, the specifics of how, when, and where these policies and programs and objectives are implemented are decided and determined within the armed forces without civilian oversight and approval. The details, the timelines, and other operational particulars seem to be decided and implemented by military leaders without any consultation or approval by civilian superiors. In short, the PLA is not totally out of civilian control, but neither is China's military establishment completely under civilian control. This analysis suggests that, at a minimum, a poor level of co there is a poor level of coordination between Chinese bureaucracies. At a deeper level, this appears to underscore the reality that civilian or party control of the military is under-institutionalized in 21st century China. The key mechanism of control is at the apex is not the Central Military Commission I mentioned a little while ago, but I think it's rather the more informal position of the paramount leader. In the history of post-49 China, only a handful of individuals have, have held this unofficial, what I call quasi-institutionalized post currently held by Hu Jintao, whose heir apparent, Xi Jinping, has only recently begun his uh, military apprenticeship. Five months ago, he was appointed as the vice chair of the Central Military Commission, becoming only the second member of this body, second civilian member of this body. Well, while my uh, remarks today may help make sense of the words and deeds of uh, the Chinese military, this does not provide much relief or reassurance necessarily to Americans. The risk of mis miscalculation between the U.S. and China may be higher than many people assume. Once a crisis or confrontation develops, the potential for unintended escalation is significant. To conclude, there seems to be a civil military gap in China's peaceful, stri peaceful rise strategy. Soldiers are being permitted 
or even encouraged to express warlike bravado and engage in overzealous actions. If Beijing expects other nations to accept Chinese insistence about desiring a peaceful rise and yearns to be treated as a responsible or a respected great power, then the words and deeds of Chinese soldiers ought to be more consistent with those proclaimed policies and aspirations. Thank you.